books, millions of them in countless libraries. Books on every possible subject, expounding man's accumulated wisdom. Books that remove ignorance and enlighten with knowledge. But where among all these books can we find the answers to such questions as Why do we exist? Why must we die? And what hope is there for the future? Books written by imperfect men cannot give us reliable answers to these questions. But there is a book that can. Are you familiar with it? Let's take a close look at it. This is it, the Holy Bible. The other books contain the wisdom of men. The Bible contains the wisdom of God. In it we find the oldest written history of man. See what it has to tell us in this film. God cannot lie. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. Here we learn that man is a creation of God. This is logical, since only life can produce life. It tells us, Jehovah God planted a garden in Eden. It was there he put the man. Eden, shown at the top of this map, was located in the Middle East. In this part of the earth, God created the first man, and as the record says, blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man came to be a living soul. God called him Adam. What a lovely place God gave Adam as a home. It was a place of peace and great beauty, a paradise. There was food in abundance because the Bible says God provided every tree desirable to one's sight and good for food. It was the kind of place that any of us would enjoy for a home. Animals in great variety were in Eden. There were domestic animals, beasts of the field, and flying creatures of the heavens. God had created many of them before he created Adam, and now he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Adam noted the characteristics of these animals and gave them fitting names. In that paradise there was peace among all. So even the lambs were able to dwell in perfect safety with animals such as these lions. The Bible tells us that God gave man dominion over all these animals and all the fish of the sea, as well as the flying creatures. Adam would have no fear of even the most powerful of these animals, for friendship existed between man and beast. However, they were not of his flesh. So Adam was alone. For a companion, God created a perfect complement for Adam, a beautiful helpmate who was human like him. Adam then said, This at last is flesh of my flesh. This lovely woman became the mother of all of us. Our first parents were commanded by God, Be fruitful and become many and fill the earth and subdue it. They had the prospect of eternal life in this wonderful paradise. Eventually it would have spread earth wide to make room for us. You and I could have been living in a paradise like this today if Adam had only obeyed God.
but he lost it all by rebelling against God. Speaking through a serpent, a rebellious angel deceived Eve, making her believe that God had lied. Adam, knowing the penalty, joined in disobedience to God. Angels drove Adam and Eve out of paradise and guarded the entrance to prevent their return. What a loss this has been to us. Now began the age-long fight against thorns and thistles as they tilled the earth. Sickness and grief became our lot. In the sweat of our faces we must eke out a living. At last, to this earth from which we gain our food, we return in death. Yes, Adam was our first father. By his sin, he brought death to us. Within 1,600 years, Adam's descendants became so bad that God determined to cleanse the earth. Creatures of every kind were led into a huge ark that Noah and his sons had built, because they believed that God meant it when he said that destruction was impending. Now to get inside for safety. That world had turned its back on God and was going to be wiped out in a global deluge. As God foretold, the flood came. That world perished at his hands because it had no love for him or for righteousness. There was no escape for these wicked people, not even on the mountaintops. They had been warned, but they did not believe God. What happened to them should impress us with the fact that God does not lie. The water covered the tallest mountains of that time. All humans and animals outside the ark were destroyed. The ark itself floated securely on the water. Inside the ark, Noah and his family safely rode out the flood. They believed God. Noah did everything that God had commanded him. He prepared for the flood. He built the ark. As the Bible says, he did just so. And God rewarded him. After many months, the water had subsided enough so the mountaintops showed again. At the end of a full year, the earth was dry, and Noah and those with him left the ark. God blessed them, and he said, The rainbow I do give as a sign of my covenant, that never again will a deluge bring the earth to ruin. From Ararat, Noah's descendants migrated southward and God's purpose toward us took a forward step with one of them who lived here. He was Abraham. Abraham trusted God, so he moved out of Ur of Chaldea when God commanded him, Go your way out of your country and from your relatives and from the house of your father to the country that I will show you. He stopped for a time in Haran, until the death of his father. Then he started out again, crossing the Euphrates River. Moving west and south across an expanse of the desert with his family and flocks, he came into a sparsely settled land. Near the mountains of Lebanon, Abraham no doubt passed through an area like this. Let's look at it for a few minutes. If you had come from land that was mostly flat, as Abraham did, you would be impressed with a place bordered by mountains such as this. But there is more than beauty in these mountains. There is water for the land. From this mountain in particular, Mount Hermon, 
Rising over 9,000 feet comes water for the Jordan, the principal river here. Not only does Hermon nourish the Jordan, but its snows are a source of refreshing dew. Here we see one of the sources of the Jordan. During the spring, snows on Mount Hermon melt and this gentle stream becomes a torrent. In some sections, the flow is dangerously swift at this time. From here, the river grows in size as it races to the south. The river is appropriately named Jordan, for that word means descender. It drops 3,000 feet as it plunges down to the Dead Sea, the lowest spot on Earth. As we continue our trip through the land, we see orchard and men farming the fields. They work hard to get their crops. Even to this day, we observe that they use oxen and simple plows, much as they did in Abraham's day. But Abraham was not like these men. He did not settle to do farming. God had made him an alien resident in the land. As Abraham moved about, his flocks increased. But he was no materialist. He gave thanks to Jehovah for what he had and came to be known as a chieftain of God. His flocks included animals such as these sheep with their wide, fat tails. In time, they became so numerous that he had to separate his flocks from those of his nephew Lot. Generously, he let Lot choose whatever part of the land he wanted. Abraham had faith that Jehovah would continue to care for him. What was God's purpose with Abraham? He told him, Raise your eyes, please, and look to the north and south, because the land at which you are looking, to you and to your seed I am going to give it. And I will constitute your seed like the dust particles of the earth, so that if a man could count them, then your seed could be numbered. Abraham believed Jehovah. He knew that God would fulfill his word. But here in the region of the Dead Sea, where Lot had settled, were people who had no faith in God. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were notoriously wicked. God warned Lot to move out because he was going to destroy them. Fire and sulfur from heaven poured down upon those cities. The Bible says that Abraham saw from a distance thick smoke ascending from the land like thick smoke of a kiln. Lot and his daughters fled to the city of Zoar. Because his wife disobeyed God by looking back, she was caught by vapors and became a pillar of salt. Here in the safety of Zoar, Lot and his daughters expressed gratitude for their deliverance. These are thought to be the ruins of the city of Zoar. They are on the eastern shore of the Dead Sea, not far from where Sodom and Gomorrah were. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was because of their immorality. Today they are covered with this water. The Bible states, by destroying them, God set a pattern of things to come. The earth will be cleansed. Abraham's faith was tested when God commanded him to sacrifice his son, Isaac. With full faith, he obeyed, but an angel stayed his hand. What Abraham did pictured that God himself would offer up his son for us.
In time, Abraham died and was buried with his wife in Hebron, where this city now is. Abraham's descendants continued to dwell here in Canaan for another hundred years, and then Jacob, who was also known as Israel, moved with his household down around the end of the Mediterranean Sea to Goshen in the northern part of Egypt. In Egypt, the pharaohs ruled. They were not worshippers of Jehovah. In fact, many of the pharaohs themselves were worshipped as gods. And when they died, their subjects buried them in these pyramids, which are actually giant tombs. Here in fertile Goshen, the Israelites were given land on which to live. They were favored by Pharaoh because Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, had recently become prime minister in the land. In fact, they were given the very best of the land. In time, the children of Israel began to multiply in numbers, and their wives became exceedingly fruitful. They were a peaceful people who tended their flocks and herds. They did their work on the land that had been given them. But a new pharaoh thought these people were a threat to his nation. He set over them chiefs of forced labor and cruelly oppressed them. Pharaoh's heart was just as hard as this stone sphinx. He ordered that all the Israelite boy babies be thrown into the Nile River. He sought to annihilate Israel. Yet these reeds along the Nile became a lodging place for one Israelite boy. His mother kept him at home three months, but when she was no longer able to keep him without being noticed, she put the babe in a waterproof basket and put it among the reeds along a river bank. Jehovah did not allow that babe to die. Pharaoh's own daughter caught sight of the basket and had her attendants bring it to her. When she saw the baby weeping, she was moved with compassion and preserved him. This boy was Moses, and by means of him, God would deliver his people. Pharaoh's heart remained hard. Nine plagues from God did not soften it. Though Moses, now an older man, appeared before him, he did not listen. Proud Pharaoh had no respect for Jehovah. Now a tenth and final plague from God struck all Egypt, killing the firstborn of animals and Egyptians even this slave. Pharaoh's house did not escape either. His own firstborn son was struck down by Jehovah's angel. The Bible tells us that after this blow, Pharaoh at last released the enslaved Israelites. The firstborn of Israel were not destroyed, however. These Israelites kept the Passover at God's command. With a mighty hand, God freed his people from Egyptian slavery. And now he brought them out of the land along with their flocks and herds. But they did not take a direct route to Canaan, the land that Jehovah had promised Abraham. First, God led them down to the south. Pharaoh thought they were lost. Again, his wicked heart showed itself. He hastily made ready his ward chariots and set out in pursuit. From Goshen, the Israelites had already moved down to the Red Sea. Here, Jehovah parted the waters and led them through the dry seabed. But when the pursuing Egyptians tried to follow them, Moses raised his arms, and God caused the waters to crash down on their heads. 
From the Red Sea, they traveled on foot for over two months until they arrived at the wilderness close to Sinai and camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. The Israelites, over two million in number, were organized by God into a nation. Each of the twelve tribes was assigned its own location around the center of the camp. Then, through his spokesman Moses, God took another step toward our salvation. He gave this nation laws by which to live, including the Ten Commandments. In time, God directed them to build the tabernacle for worship, and you see it here with the covering rolled back. A miraculous cloud hanging over it represented Jehovah's presence. Here, animal sacrifices were made for their sins. Such sacrifices foreshadowed the sacrifice of God's own Son, which would open the way for us to return to paradise. From Mount Sinai, God led the Israelites up to the southern border of Canaan. From Kadesh Barnea, men were sent in to spy out the land. They wanted to see what kind of crops it produced. It was well watered. It was a rich land. As they traveled on, they could observe people at work. It was evident that this was a land that could supply grain. They would never want for bread. It was a rich land, and soon the Israelites could occupy it and reap its fruitage. On the spies went into Galilee. Even today, grapes are grown here, but what they found were immense. There were animals of many kinds, some for work, others just fun to watch. Goats such as these young ones flourished in the land. In this hilly country, they were easy to raise. Their hair could be woven into durable cloth for garments and for tents. They would also provide the Israelites with milk in abundance. Had God not told them that the land to which he was taking them was a land flowing with milk and honey? This well-watered land gave the spies reason to bring back a good report, but ten did not. They were afraid. Failing to trust God, that generation lost this land and got land part of which was like this, a wilderness. To them God said, Your carcasses will fall in the wilderness. Forty years you will wander here. It took place just as God said. If you were to tour the Bible lands, you might travel through here to the Edomite city of Petra, located at the end of this gorge. Petra was one of the strongholds of a people related to Israel. But when the Israelites came near this territory, Edom showed no love for them. Moses sent to the king to ask permission to lead his people through the land. They promised to pay even for the water that they used. But Edom said, No, you must not pass through our land. Such bitter hatred they continued to show Israel for centuries. Edom felt secure, but in these mountains, they were not beyond the reach of God. Through his prophets, Jehovah later warned them, Your presumptuousness is what has deceived you, you who reside in the retreats of the crag, but you will become a desolate waste. As these ruins testify, God does not lie. Later, Israel came to these plains of Moab.
From Mount Nebo, Moses, now 120 years of age, viewed the land that God had promised to Abraham's descendants. There it lay, on the other side of the Jordan. It was a rich and fertile land, a land of promise. But, as you see, it has changed greatly since Moses' day, though God's purpose has not. Unlike their fathers, the new generation of Israelites did not hesitate to take the land. They trusted God to fight for them as he had promised, and Jehovah did not fail them. After Moses died, God commanded Joshua, Cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving them. They were to be God's executioners of a wicked people whose temples were centers of vice, who sacrificed their own children to idols. The Canaanites were worse than Sodom. As a nation, Israel crossed the Jordan River into Canaan. This is Gilgal, the site of their first camp in Canaan. It became a base for their operations. But when the kings of the land heard what was happening, their hearts began to melt. In great fear, some tightly shut up their cities. Those mounds in the center of the picture mark the place where the ancient city of Jericho once stood. Seven days the Israelites marched around this city. On the seventh day, they marched around seven times, trumpets blaring, and then Joshua commanded the people to shout. And these walls came crashing down. There was no power on earth that could save Jericho. Jehovah was fighting for his people and gave them victory. Yet one household on the wall was preserved, that of Rahab, because she had showed faith in Jehovah and had aided his people. Ai, thought to be that mound in the background, was the next city to be taken. Following battle instructions provided by God, Joshua and the men of Israel burned the city. From Ai, the Israelites went a little north to Mount Gerizim. They did not immediately continue the war, but gathered here between Mount Gerizim on the right and Mount Ebal on the left to review the law of God. On obedience to him, their success depended. On this occasion, Joshua read aloud to the people the law of Jehovah, possibly from a position on these rocks, overlooking this valley where they were congregated. One city that was not destroyed by Israel was Gibeon. The city was amply supplied with water from wells such as this one seen today. Those drawing water from it often had to descend these stairs for a considerable distance. In spite of being well equipped to withstand siege, Gideon capitulated to Israel. From this city of Gibeon, one of the chief cities of the land, men went to Joshua disguised as distant travelers. They said they had heard what Jehovah had done for Israel. They wanted to make a covenant with Israel. Because of the covenant, the Israelites spared them and made them servants to assist in the work at the tabernacle. Israel now turned its attention to the south, to territory around Lachish, ruins of which from a later time you see here. But this was no human war of aggression to seize the territory of another people. The inhabitants of this land had sunk to shocking depths of immorality. Their own children they threw in the fire to sacrifice to idol gods. 
So Jehovah used Israel as his executioners of these depraved people. Though other armies came to assist Lachish, they could not succeed. They were fighting not merely against Israel, but against God. It does no good to try to thwart the purpose of God. If we would avoid coming to ruin, we must conform to his will. Vividly, the Bible book of Joshua relates these events for our instruction. It impresses us with the fact that God never fails to fulfill his word. In time, much of this territory would come under Israel's control. But at present, as indicated by the arrows, their efforts began to be directed toward north. There, one of the mightiest confederations of that time gathered to fight them. The head of that confederation was this now-ruined city of Hazor. But they could not stand up against God's people. Centuries before, Jehovah had promised this land to Abraham and to his people. When he brought them out of Egypt, he gave his word that the land of Canaan would become their possession. Jehovah fulfilled his promise by giving them these cities. Gathering Israel here in Shiloh, Joshua divided the land among those who had not yet received a portion. It was here, too, that they located the tabernacle. So the priest offered up incense and made sacrifices on behalf of the people here. Farther to the north is this valley of Estrealon, which cuts clear across the land. Here Jehovah performed powerful acts to preserve his people alive in their land. The Bible account, entitled Judges, enables us to relive these events. It tells us that, some years after Joshua's day, faithful Barak got together with a volunteer army in this area. In the valley, Canaanites under Sisera were massed against them with 900 chariots equipped with vicious iron knives on the wheel hubs. As Barak and his men camped here on Mount Tabor, God gave assurance that he was with them. Then Jehovah sent a flash flood through the valley, throwing the enemy camp into confusion. Sisera's chariots were put out of action. Now was the time for Barak to act. He knew that God had performed a powerful act on their behalf and that God was delivering Sisera and his forces into their hands. So down from Mount Tabor charged the Israelites on foot, descending upon the bogged-down Canaanites. The route was complete. Not so much as one of them remained. With faith in God, Barak and his men had acted. Their faith was rewarded with victory. The Bible lets us know that without faith it is impossible to please God. As a later Bible writer said, Barak was such a man of faith, he was one who through faith defeated kingdoms. In this valley of Megiddo, God gave him victory over the Canaanites. His example encourages us to put faith in God. Again, Israelites' faith was tested here at Mount Gilboa in the days of Gideon. Oppressive Midian had gathered its army here to fight Israel. The Israelites, too, assembled over 32,000 men of war. But where is the faith, you ask? They had a strong army. God chose this location to teach them a lesson that would strengthen their faith. God had Gideon sent home from here 22,000 men. 
but 10,000 were still too many. So at this well of Herod, he reduced their numbers further. As they drink here, Gideon observed, 9,700 relaxed their guard as they got down to drink. The water was refreshing. They became engrossed in drinking. All of these were sent away. Only 300 remained. With this small band, God purposed to deliver Israel. But how? At night, Gideon and his men spread out around the camp of Midian, but there were only 300 of them, while over there near the hill of Morak were 135,000 Midianites, 450 to 1. At the signal, they blew their horns, held aloft their torches, and shouted. Confusion broke out in the Midianite camp. They turned against one another. Israel had won. Because of their might? No, Jehovah gave them the victory. Yes, Jehovah rewards the faith of his people. The period during which judges like Barak and Gideon ruled Israel lasted for about 350 years. After that, they came to have kings like the pagan nations around them. The Bible's record of this begins in 1 Samuel. Let's turn our attention to this period of history. If you were to visit this part of the world, what would this place mean to you? Not much, perhaps? Yet you are viewing a ravine near the village of Michmash, northwest of Jericho. In the days of the kings of Israel, biblical history was being made here. It was in this place that, with a small force, Saul, the first king of Israel, confronted the Philistines. The Israelites were on the hill to the right, and the Philistines on the left. The Israelites kept themselves hidden, for they were fearful. But in faith, Saul's son, Jonathan, and his armor-bearer made their way down from the hill on the right. Then they crossed this ravine and climbed up toward the Philistine outpost. The Philistines saw them coming and taunted, Come on up to us and we will let you know a thing. Jonathan kept advancing. Those Philistines failed to realize that Jehovah was with Israel, and Jehovah is the living God. Victory did not depend on Israel's battle equipment. Confusion broke out among the Philistines. This earth began to tremble under their feet, and a violent quaking developed at the hand of God. Not only the Philistine outposts, but the rest of them, situated back there where you see the village of Michmash, broke into turmoil. In wild confusion, the Philistines turned against one another, and the root was great. Jehovah was saving Israel. In another encounter with the Philistines, Saul's forces faced the enemy across this valley of Elah, southwest of Michmash. A Philistine giant arrogantly strode out into the valley and called up to the Israelites, I myself do taunt the battle lines of Israel. Give me a man, and let us fight together. The Israelites were terrified. Only the shepherd boy David had strong enough faith in God to accept Goliath's challenge. Rejecting the armor of fighting men, David selected five stones for his sling from a stream bed in the valley. When Goliath saw him crossing this valley with only a staff and a sling, he snorted, Am I a dog so that you're coming to me with staves? David confidently replied, You are coming to me with a sword and a spear, but I am coming to you with the name of Jehovah. This day Jehovah will surrender you into my hand. 
David slung the stone. It sank into the giant's head. With his fall, the Philistines fled. North of the valley of Estrion, on this hill, Endor once stood. When King Saul visited here, he no longer enjoyed God's favor. Too often he had rejected the word of Jehovah. Now he was again violating God's law by coming here to consult a spirit medium. What was the result? God no longer protected Saul. Upon the wall of the city of Bethshan, which once stood here, the Philistines hung Saul's body after he had been wounded and then committed suicide. God's word explains, Saul died for his unfaithfulness and for making inquiry of a spirit medium. But there still were men of faith in the land. David was such, and God gave him the kingship. At the city of Hebron, David was anointed as king by the tribe of Judah. After the death of Saul's son, all the other tribes came to Hebron and anointed David as king over them. Of this man, David, God said, He is a man agreeable to my own heart. In David's city, Jerusalem on the left, was occupied by Jebusites who boasted that David could never take their city. But David's men crawled into the city through this water tunnel from outside the walls and captured it. Lying outside modern-day Jerusalem are these ruins of Jerusalem of David's day. If you were to visit here today, you would find a Jerusalem that was built by the Romans. Of the ancient city, you would only find rubble. That ancient city which stood here was known as the city of our God because this was the center for true worship. Where this Muslim mosque with the gold dome now stands, Jehovah's temple once was. It was a magnificent structure of stone and cedar wood. From the cedar trees that once covered these mountains of Lebanon came the lumber for that temple. Solomon was king of Israel then, and he directed the building. Servants of Hiram, king of Tyre, cut these cedar trees and moved the logs to the Mediterranean Sea, where they were floated down the coast. When the temple was completed, it was beautiful. The pattern for Solomon's temple had been provided by God. Both this temple and the worship carried on here were of great significance. The sacrifices that were consumed upon this flaming altar at that temple are of interest even to those of us here today. Why so? Because they pictured the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who died once for all time to atone for our sins and to open the way to paradise. Solomon's building program also included these reservoirs. Jehovah had blessed Solomon in his work. But in his old age, Solomon allowed his foreign wives to turn him to idolatry. So Jehovah said, I'm going to rip the kingdom away from you. Following the death of the builder of these things, the kingdom was split, as God foretold. Ten tribes formed the northern kingdom. In its southern part was Bethel, the ruins of which you see here. At this place, a golden calf was set up for worship. 
By providing new religious centers, the king hoped to keep people from going to the temple in Jerusalem. Here at Dan in the north was placed a second golden calf. But this was in violation of God's commandment that they were not to make a carved image. Yet, calf worship became the sin of every king of the northern kingdom. God had warned of the consequences, and they were sure to come to pass. Upon this mountain was built Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. But today it is a heap of ruins. Why? Because, like the cities of Bethel and Dan, it became a center of religion that featured the use of idols. Calf worship was carried on here. These facts are recorded in the Bible books of Kings and Chronicles for our benefit. We're looking again at the Valley of Estrelan. Through this valley, Assyrian armies came when they conquered the Ten Tribe Kingdom and destroyed Samaria. God permitted the Assyrians to punish the people for their unfaithfulness. The record says, The king of Assyria took Israel into exile over the fact that they had not listened to the voice of Jehovah their God. We cannot ignore God's word without bringing calamity on ourselves. In the distance, you see the hill where Megiddo itself was situated. This city was strategically located, controlling the pass through the mountains on the trade route to Egypt. Visitors find Megiddo well marked. These are actual events of history, and they are recorded in the Bible. The Bible is not filled with imagination. It is a book of truth. To the south, outside Jerusalem, is found this Valley of Hinnom. It was located in the Kingdom of Judah, which lasted more than a century after the Northern Kingdom fell. But in time, shocking idolatrous practices took hold here too. Because the people of Jerusalem no longer gave heed to God, He brought destruction on their city. It was burned with fire when the Babylonians, as God's executioners, at last smashed through the defenses in 607 BCE. Why did this happen? The Bible book of Jeremiah answers, Because God spoke to them, but they did not listen. From their burning city, survivors were taken away captive to Babylon. Under the watchful eyes of Babylonian soldiers, the captive Israelites moved out of the land. But soon after this, the prophet Daniel was inspired to write part of the Bible, and in it God foretold the fall of Babylon itself, the rise and fall of Persia, Greece, Rome, and the powers of our day. So, in time, the Medes and Persians descended upon Babylon broke its power and granted to the Jews freedom to return to their homeland. Within 200 years, the armies of Alexander the Great came in from Greece, where this Parthenon is located, and crushed the power of Medo-Persia. The land city of Tyre was in ruins when the armies of Greece arrived, it had been destroyed by the Babylonians, and the survivors had fled to another part of the city on a nearby island. Because Tyre rejoiced when Jerusalem fell, God said he would bring Tyre down in ruins. And this is all that remains today.
As the Bible book of Ezekiel tells us, God had said, Your stones and your dust they will place in the midst of the water. This was fulfilled over 250 years later when the Greeks came against the well-fortified island city about a half mile offshore. Alexander's men built a causeway out to the island city by dumping the ruins of the land city into the water. This is exactly what had been foretold by God through his prophet Ezekiel. Over this causeway, Alexander led his troops with their siege engines. The island city was not able to hold out. As prophesied, it too was defeated. The fall of even this island city emphasizes the eternal truth that God cannot lie. Whatever he has foretold comes to pass. So prophecies found in the Bible are a sound guide for our lives. Nothing but ruins remain of this city that rejoiced over the misfortune of God's people. What we see here should make a deep impression on each one of us. It should strengthen our faith because it is an assurance that the wicked will not prosper indefinitely. The Bible in its book of Psalms promises, Just a little longer and the wicked one will be no more and you will certainly give attention to his place, and he will not be. For the wicked themselves shall perish. Certain desolation, as we see here in Tyre, awaits any nation that opposes God and acts wickedly toward those who bear his name. Though Greece was used to execute judgment on Tyre, it had been foretold that Greece, too, would be succeeded by a stronger empire. The Roman Empire, whose territory you see depicted here in red, was that world power. In Rome today, monuments of the past are still in existence. But no longer is Rome the master of the world. Ancient ruins such as these silently testify to faded glory. However, in the first century, Rome held sway over Palestine. But this did not prevent God from bringing out of that land the one who would provide salvation for us. Here in the town of Nazareth, near the beginning of our common era, an angel appeared to Mary, a virgin promised in marriage to a carpenter named Joseph. The angel said, You will give birth to a son, and you are to call his name Jesus. This one will be called Son of the Most High. He was born here in Bethlehem. Shortly before his birth, Joseph and Mary arrived here in town. Lack of accommodations made it necessary for them to lodge in a stable, and it was there that Mary gave birth to Jesus. In the nearby fields, there were shepherds tending their flocks. It was not yet winter, so they were still out of doors, probably in this area, which has come to be known as the Shepherd's Field. On that night of Jesus' birth, an angel appeared to the shepherds, and Jehovah's glory shone, as he said, I am declaring to you news of a great joy that all the people will have. The first reaction of the shepherds was one of fear, but as they listened, they heard the angel say, Have no fear. There was born to you today a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The amazed shepherds hurried to town, and there they found the place where Jesus had been born and laid in a stable manger. Joseph and the others marveled as they heard about the angel's announcement of the birth of this child. This was the one of whom the prophets had spoken of long ago. 
Over 700 years in advance, Jehovah had foretold, From you, O Bethlehem, there will come out to me the one who is to become ruler in Israel. He was born at the time and in the place promised, because God's word is true. Sometime later, Joseph and Mary fled from this town of Bethlehem, taking Jesus down to Egypt. What had happened? Jealous King Herod had heard that a boy had been born who was to become king of the Jews. In rage, he ordered all the young boys here in Bethlehem and its district killed. But an angel warned Joseph, so he left for Egypt. After the death of Herod, Joseph returned and settled here in Galilee. Thus another prophecy was fulfilled, because God had foretold, Out of Egypt I call my son. It had been prophesied of Jesus, He will be called a Nazarene. So it was that Jesus grew up in this town of Nazareth. It was a rather insignificant place, out of the way, but here in the hills of Galilee, Jesus could grow to manhood in relative safety. As his parents taught him, Jesus went on progressing in wisdom and in favor with God and men. Visitors to the old town of Nazareth will find that it has not changed much since the days of Jesus. The streets are still narrow. Donkeys with saddlebags on each side are still used to carry burdens. And women carry loads on their heads when they go to the market, as they've done for centuries. In this town with its small shops, Jesus became known as the carpenter's son. However, at the age of 30, Jesus left his hometown and went to this river, the Jordan, to be baptized. After he had been completely submerged in the water by John the Baptist and raised up again, something miraculous occurred. A voice was heard from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved. I have approved you. Some months later, Jesus was in Galilee. Here in Capernaum, the ruins of a synagogue remain even today. In such places, people gathered every Sabbath. Jesus used such opportunities to preach to people as they sat on benches like these. One day he visited the synagogue in his own town of Nazareth. At first, some were pleased with what he had said, but then they got angry at what he preached. It was on this occasion that Jesus read to that assembly from a scroll of the prophet of Isaiah, saying, Jehovah's Spirit is on me, because he anointed me to declare the good news. Then he explained to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled. It applied to him. But when Jesus made unfavorable remarks about their own religious attitude, they became enraged and tried to kill him, though they did not succeed. In recent years, near the Dead Sea, some ancient Bible manuscripts have been found, including a copy of Isaiah. Study of them shows that the scriptures from what Jesus read there in Nazareth contain the same thoughts as our Bibles today. This location is known as Qumran. Goat herds in this area, quite by accident, found this cave. He climbed the face of the bluff and, with difficulty, got to the entrance. Here in the cave he found the 2,000-year-old scroll of Isaiah, which shows that our Bibles today are authentic.
Many things recorded in the Bible took place near here. This is the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus preached. For these people he sometimes illustrated his work in terms of the fishing that they did. On one occasion he talked to four men who did fishing here, as these men are, and invited them to join him in preaching the good news concerning God's kingdom. Fishing ceased to be their principal work. Now they became not catchers of these fish, but fishers of men. Alongside the Sea of Galilee is this mountain, where, it is said, Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount. Can't you just picture yourself as being there and listening as Jesus said, Happy are those conscious of their spiritual need. Happy are the mild-tempered ones and those thirsting for righteousness. Happy the merciful. Happy are those pure in heart and those who are peaceable. From distant points people had come and they were impressed by what he said. He emphasized the importance of the kingdom of God. He told them to pray for it and to seek it first. He made it clear that not material riches, but the kingdom that God himself establishes will fulfill our hopes for the future. In his preaching, Jesus traveled often to Jerusalem. Jesus came on foot, but today visitors arrive at this airport by plane to see where Jesus taught. As you walk through the streets of Jerusalem, this is what you see. The streets are narrow, as in Jesus' day, but the city has changed. These buildings were built at a later date. It was to people in such surroundings that Jesus preached the good news. He taught them to believe the Bible. Here in Jerusalem, Jesus also performed miracles. One of those miracles was performed here at the Pool of Bethsaida. Jesus approached a man here who had been sick for 38 years and asked, Do you want to become sound in health? Any of us would have answered yes. This man too wanted to be well, and he thought these waters could heal him. But Jesus simply told him, Pick up your cot and walk. This man did just that. He had been healed. Jesus was able to do even more. This he demonstrated at nearby Bethany. It was here that his friend Lazarus lived with his sisters Mary and Martha. But Lazarus has died. Lazarus has been buried in a cave. When Jesus asked that they open it, Martha said, By now he must smell. He's been dead for four days. Intently they watched. Amazement on their faces as he prayed aloud to God. Then he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come on out! And the man that had been dead came out with his feet and hands in wrappings. Yes, Jesus even had power to raise the dead. Shortly before his own death, Jesus arrived at the Mount of Olives. Seated on a donkey, he headed down into the valley outside of Jerusalem. Upon the road to the city, he went as the crowds shouted, Save, we pray, the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in Jehovah's name. This triumphal entry, perhaps near this gate, fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah that said, Be joyful, O Jerusalem, your king comes to you, humble, riding upon a donkey. 
Having passed through a gate, like this one now closed off, as you see, he headed toward the temple. As he moved along, the city was thrown into commotion. Someone asked, Who's this man? The crowd responded, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Those who had been present when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead bore witness to it. As he moved along across the stones of the temple area, the religious leaders in Jerusalem were greatly upset. Irritated by the rejoicing, they said, The whole world has gone after him. Money is what they wanted, not true worship. But this was God's house. In indignation, Jesus overturned their tables. The money changing and the selling was disrupted. Pointedly, Jesus told them, In God's word it is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a cave of robbers. Here in the city, the chief priest plotted to destroy Jesus, but he left Jerusalem. The next day he sat down out there on the Mount of Olives with his disciples to tell them what the future would hold for them and us. In these surroundings his disciples asked a question in which we are interested in. What will be the sign of your presence? With Herod's temple in the background, he proceeded to describe for them what would mark his second presence and the end of the present wicked system of things. Having told them of the coming destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus went on to speak of world wars, widespread famine, disease, and earthquakes. He also foretold the preaching of the established kingdom of God in all the earth. These things we have witnessed in our day. Jesus likened what he would do from heaven at this time to what these people are doing with their sheep and goats. Today, Jesus is separating people. Those with a sheep-like disposition, he puts in a place of favor. They respond to the kingdom message carried by Jesus' spiritual brothers. Those who show themselves stubborn, like goats, are separated to a place of disfavor. These, Jesus said, will depart into destruction. May we avoid such a future. But what must we do? Jesus' life as a man on earth was about to end. It was the day before the Jewish Passover, and as evening drew near, Jesus' apostles had already made arrangements for the use of a large upper room in Jerusalem for the occasion. The city was crowded, but since the Jewish day began at sunset, they awaited till the sun had gone down before they began the Passover meal. As that first Passover in Egypt marked the day of liberation, so this Passover would mark a greater liberation. Jesus was with his apostles as they reclined around the table for this last Passover that he would eat with them. After the Passover, he instituted something new. The apostles listened intently as he spoke, explaining the significance of what he was doing. From the table he gave them bread to represent his body and wine to symbolize his blood. Each year they were to keep a memorial of what Jesus here began. To this select group who had stuck with him he said, I make a covenant with you for a kingdom. They would roll with him from heaven. But there was one who had not stuck with him. He had left his place at the table and had gone out into the night to work with the enemies of Jesus to betray him to death. 
Judas had gone bad. Love of money crowded out his love for God, and for thirty pieces of silver he betrayed the Son of God. After Jesus had concluded the meal that night, he came out to the Garden of Gethsemane, which you see here. Leaving his disciples, he went a little distance away and prayed to God in heaven. If possible, let this pass away from me. Yet, Father, not as I will, but as you will. When he returned to where his disciples were, they had fallen asleep. But a critical time was at hand. So he urged them to keep on the watch and to pray so that they would not fall into temptation. This was a place to which Jesus had come often. So Judas knew the location. Before long he arrived and with him a crowd with swords to seize Jesus. But Jesus did not resist. They had been sent by the chief priests who opposed Jesus' preaching to take him into custody. In the morning they turned him over to the Roman governor, and in this location soldiers put a crown of thorns on him and made sport of him, saying, Good day, you king of the Jews! And they would slap him. With his hands bound, Jesus was brought outside to the crowd, and Pilate told them, I find no fault in him. But the priest in front of the palace yelled, Impale him! Pilate tried again, saying, See your king! But again the priest cried, We have no king but Caesar! So Pilate gave in. From the governor's palace, they led Jesus off to be impaled. Visitors to Jerusalem today are told that this is the street through which he was taken on his way out to be put to death. As you walk along, picture what happened here. With a crowd following, Jesus was forced to drag the stake. It was a heavy tree trunk on which he was to be impaled. So, as they went out, the guards compelled a bystander to help him carry it. Following them were women who kept beating themselves in grief. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. On the contrary, weep for yourselves and for your children. Jesus knew that because of what was happening that day, Jerusalem be desolated. Outside the city gate, the procession moved on toward the place of execution. Two other men, evildoers, were being led along with him as they headed up the hill. It was called Skull Place because of those caves that made it look like a skull. With Jesus in the center, they were impaled. But Jesus was no sinner, nor did he die because God could not free him. Willingly, he laid down his life as a sacrifice. This is what was foreshadowed when Abraham attempted to offer up his son. This is what was pictured by all the animal sacrifices in Israel. In this way, God's own Son died for us. It was enemies who nailed Jesus to the stake, but God permitted it, because by his death, Christ could ransom all of us from the sin and death inherited from Adam. The charge posted over Jesus' head read, King of the Jews. And to one of the evildoers who expressed faith in his kingdom, Jesus said, You will be with me in paradise.
Later that day, Jesus was laid in a tomb in a nearby garden. This is thought to be the place. It was a tomb cut out of the rock, and a large stone was used to close the entrance. The chief priests prevailed on Pilate to post guards at the tomb, but this could not prevent Jesus' resurrection. Early on the third day, an angel descended from heaven and rolled back the stone at the entrance of the grave. The guards fell back terrified and became as dead men. When they recovered sufficiently, they headed for the town to report to the priests what happened. It may have been in this burial place that Jesus was laid, but when his disciples came on the third day, they found the tomb open and the body gone. The angel appeared to them and said, Why are you looking for the living one among the dead? He has been raised up. Jesus' resurrection is God's guarantee that others will rise too. Later on the day of his resurrection, Jesus appeared to two of his disciples as they traveled along this way. As they walked toward Emmaus, there in the distance, Jesus reminded them of the things written about him by Jehovah's prophets. God's word had proved true. Both in Emmaus and elsewhere they saw him with their own eyes. Jesus had indeed been raised. Then, at a mountain in Galilee, to over 500 present, the resurrected Jesus set the pattern for Christian activity. He commanded, Go and make disciples of people of all nations. Later, after urging his disciples again to preach, Jesus ascended to heaven from here on the Mount of Olives. Following Jesus' ascension to heaven, his disciples remained here in the city of Jerusalem. They stayed close together, using an upper room in the city as a meeting place where they could join in prayer. After ten days, something miraculous occurred. A noise came from heaven, just like that of a stiff breeze, and it filled the whole house. Tongues, as if of fire, became visible and one sat upon each one of this group of 120 disciples. They were all filled with Holy Spirit, and immediately they could preach about Jesus in many foreign tongues. When people there in the city heard the commotion, they rushed together to see what was happening. Visitors from foreign countries were amazed as they heard the disciples talking about God in their languages, yet none of these disciples were from foreign lands. The Apostle Peter explained, The Holy Spirit that makes this possible came from God through Jesus Christ. But who is this man? A prison guard. Yes, there were those who hated the truth. And as they had persecuted Jesus, so they persecuted his followers. They had them thrown into jail. But during the night, an angel of Jehovah opened the doors and let them out, past the sleeping guard. These apostles of Jesus were not shaken with fear. It was not the first time that they had been in jail because of preaching. When the angel directed them to go back to Herod's temple and keep on using their mouths to preach, they did it. Though their talking about Jesus did not please the religious leaders, the apostles obeyed God rather than man. When persecution became even more intense, many of the disciples were scattered to outlying areas. Though away from Jerusalem, they preached everywhere. 
Along a desert road leading to Gaza, one of those disciples by the name of Philip had an experience preaching to a man. The man invited Philip to get into his chariot with him and explain to him the scriptures. Philip did, telling him about Jesus. After departing from that man, who had now become a believer in Jesus Christ, Philip came here to Ashdod, and he kept on declaring the good news. In all these places, the disciples preached mainly to Jews. But a change was due. While staying in a house near the sea here in Joppa, divine instructions were given to Peter that sent him to preach to non-Jews. When messengers from a Gentile army officer came for Peter, he left Joppa and traveled to Caesarea with them. God had told Peter, Go with them. And the messengers too said to Peter, A holy angel told Cornelius to send for you to hear the things you have to say. In Caesarea, Peter was warmly welcomed. As he observed how God was opening the way for Gentiles to gain salvation, Peter said, I perceive that God is not partial, but in every nation the man that fears him is acceptable to him. Cornelius and his household listened as Peter explained God's provision through Christ. While Peter was yet speaking, Holy Spirit came upon these Gentiles. And Peter, seeing this, instructed that they be baptized. In time, the good news spread to Greece. Here on the Areopagus in Athens, the Apostle Peter urged the people to leave their lifeless idols and worship the living God, the one who created heaven and earth. Some who heard him believed. In Caesarea, too, Paul preached. A fine port had been built here by King Herod, and this city along the Mediterranean coast became a Roman capital. Caesarea was located about 60 miles from Jerusalem. As the Apostle Paul came and went on his missionary journeys through Asia Minor and Greece, he frequently stopped here. You can read about Paul's visits to these interesting places in that portion of the Bible known as the Acts of the Apostles. After years of preaching in many lands, the Apostle Paul found himself again in this port city. He had been falsely accused by religious opposers and was now a Roman prisoner. Here he remained for about two years. When given opportunity, Paul defended himself before King Agrippa, and he preached earnestly to him. Agrippa acknowledged that Paul had violated no law, but Paul had appealed to Caesar in Rome, so to Rome he must go. Arriving in Italy, Paul was taken along this the Apian Way. From Rome, Christians, moved by love for their brother Paul, came out to meet him and to offer him encouragement along the way. To many people in Rome, Paul preached about the kingdom of God, but Paul had to arrange for them to visit him because he was under guard as a prisoner, though living in a house. Some years later, he was executed. In arenas similar to this one in Rome, many Christians were violently mistreated. Why? Were they criminals? On the contrary, they were noted for being law-abiding. From seats in places similar to this, Romans watched in sadistic pleasure as Christians were put to death. As Jesus foretold, the world hated them because they were unwavering to their loyalty to God.
Though these humble Christians were put on exhibition before crowds that shouted for their death, they refused to compromise by an act of worship to the emperor. They knew that worship belongs to God alone. However, these symbols of sex worship reflected the debased religion and way of life of the Romans. These pagans found delight in releasing hungry lions on innocent Christians and burning others on stakes. Would you hold fast to your faith under such circumstances? These Christians did not waver. They knew that God would reward them with future life again by means of the resurrection. But how were Jerusalem and its inhabitants faring? Were they being treated more kindly by Rome because they had said, We have no king but Caesar? No. In the year 70, the Roman legions brought Jerusalem to ruin. Even the temple with its altar had been made a wreck. As Jesus had forewarned, because they rejected the word of Jehovah and persecuted his servants, they were abandoned to the cruelty of the nation. Over a million fell by violence and tens of thousands were sold into slavery. They did not gain security by ignoring the word of God and allying themselves with Rome. True, this had been known as the house of God, but those who used it failed to give glory to God. They killed God's own son and cruelly abused God's disciples. The results of their course are inscribed on this arch in Rome. This monument commemorates the desolation of Jerusalem by Titus. In carvings, it depicts his victory. And there you see the soldiers carrying the seven-branded lampstand taken from the temple in Jerusalem. As Jesus foretold, their temple was abandoned by God. There is a lesson here for us. These facts of history testify that religious leaders who trust political alliances rather than God's kingdom bring calamity on both themselves and those who follow them. Religious organizations in our day face a like calamity. The Bible clearly foretells that even churches claiming to serve God and Christ will go down soon. Why? Because, along with the pagans, they deny God by their way of life. Just as apostate Jerusalem was destroyed, so the world empire of false religion will go down under divine judgment. Destructive forces from God on high will be directed against all other parts of this wicked system as well. As the Bible itself says, God's heavenly kingdom will crush all other kingdoms. Oppression, corruption, and injustice will end. World peace will be assured, not by political negotiators, but by God's own kingdom. Do you remember the flood of Noah's day? It foreshadowed the destruction now at hand. It also holds out hope of survival for those with faith. And don't forget that when Sodom was destroyed, Lot and his daughters were preserved. There will be survivors of this system's end, too. How can they survive? By doing as the Bible says. Yes, 
Here in the Bible, in Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3, the prophet was inspired by God to write this. Seek Jehovah, all you meek ones of the earth, who have practiced his own judicial decision. And what else? Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. Then what will result? Probably you may be concealed in the day of Jehovah's anger. By studying the Bible as these people are, they are seeking Jehovah and his righteousness. Each week they spend an hour together at home to learn the marvelous truths found in their own copy of the Bible. A qualified minister comes to assist them, and he asks no payment for his services. Just as the apostles did in the first century, so Jehovah's Witnesses in all parts of the world today freely assist others to understand God's Word. You too can have such a free Bible study in your home. To arrange for it, just ask any one of Jehovah's Witnesses. As an aid to your Bible study, you could use publications such as this one, Things in Which It Is Impossible for God to Lie. With the assistance of this book, you will learn how you can survive the conclusion of the system of things. This information is vital for everyone. Where there is just one person who wants to study the Bible, he is offered help just as readily as a family group. To people of all languages, the invitation applies. Take life's water free. Millions have the same study aid. In Spanish, German, Italian, French, Portuguese, Dutch, and in scores of other languages, they are learning that it is impossible for God to lie. As you study the Bible, you will be glad to know that others share your interest in God's Word. In over 24,000 congregations worldwide, they meet for Bible study. These places are named Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses because those who gather here pray for the Kingdom of Jehovah God and bear witness about His name and Kingdom to others. Bible talks and group discussions are provided here several times a week. They appreciate the importance of meeting together regularly, especially now as the end of the wicked system of things draws near. Those in the audience are often invited to offer comments. Their expressions are upbuilding. Knowing that God cannot lie, these people confidently look forward to His righteous new order. That new system of things will convert this earth into a delightful paradise. Yes, what our first parents lost, God will restore to us. These pleasant spots will not be limited to public parks. To the contrary, you yourself will be able to build your own home in a place as pleasant as this. Or if you prefer it, you might choose land near one of these wonders of creation. Do you enjoy the fascination of growing things? There is such delicate beauty in these creations of God. This earth produces them in a delightful variety. But how much time do any of us have to stop and examine how they are made? What a pleasure it will be in that new system to have the time to cultivate and enjoy beauties such as these 
in your own garden. If you're one that finds pleasure in birds, you can provide a place near your home where they will gladly come to enjoy your gentle care. Lovely creatures such as these will no longer flee when you approach. As it was in Eden, the animals will be at peace. None of them will prey on others. The Bible assures us that they will not do any harm in that paradise. None will be dangerous. Your own child could have one for a pet. These interesting creatures will always be a delight to man, and man will exercise loving dominion over them. Living under such tranquil conditions, who wouldn't be content? No more will there be fear of droughts that parch the land and leave crops in ruin. In even the wilderness and the desert plain, torrents of water will burst forth. God himself promises that for all the inhabitants of the earth, there will be plenty of grain Food shortages will become part of the forgotten past. The earth will yield to man's cultivating, providing an abundance. Rather than being a burial place for the dead, this earth will sustain life. Why, even graveyards will be plowed under and tombstones will be removed. No longer will there be a need to have markers for graves. Why is that? because there will be a resurrection. Do you recall what Jesus said to that evildoer who died with him? You will be with me in paradise. Christ's ransom makes this resurrection possible. This is that former evildoer. He will be resurrected in this earthly paradise. Jesus' own resurrection is a guarantee of that. To men and women of all generations, yes, your own loved ones, this blessing will come. Under God's kingdom rule, they will be afforded the opportunity to learn his law. Jesus said, all those in their memorial tombs will hear my voice and come forth. Persons of all races, languages, and national backgrounds will be included because the last book of the Bible, Revelation, declares that all in the common grave of mankind will return. Death inherited from Adam will be gone forever. This new system is not going to be brought about by man. It is the work of God from heaven, God's kingdom in the hands of Christ Jesus, will rule in righteousness. This earth will be filled with men and women who believe and obey God. Yes, persons who love their Creator and demonstrate love for their fellow man. What a thrilling experience it will be to live in that glorious paradise. Vibrant health will make every day a delight. God will open his hand and satisfy the desire of every living creature. His majestic works will never cease to fill them with awe. Throughout all eternity, his creatures will raise their voices in songs of praise. Their hearts will overflow with gratitude that Jehovah has proved for all time that he is the God who cannot lie. <laughs>